Curious Minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy. This is Mark. We're talking about AI and gaming today. Uh, we're excited to dive into this thing. We're not going to do any rants on the top end of this thing. We are going to jump right into the conversation because we have a very special guest today. Mark, give us a quick intro. Um, Wei, Wei Ji, who is the CEO and co-founder of Arena X Labs, who are making AA, AI Arena, which is incorporating AI, blockchain, into a new gaming mechanism. It's all about um, new gameplay mechanics, imitation learning. It's very, very cutting edge, and we're looking forward to hearing more. So welcome to the show, Wei. Yeah, great. Great to be here, guys. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> should, should, should we carry on where we left off? Jeremy, I think. Yeah, this is speaking of technology, uh, you know, we actually had a wonderful conversation uh, for the last <laughs> eight minutes, and that conversation was bumped off the stream for some reason. So uh, we now we now know where we're headed, and we've we've kind of had a, a an extended pre chat. So um, so we talked a little bit about let's just let's just summarize this for everybody. We talked about it in our pre chat the idea of legacy because Barry Lunn, our last guest, you know, his carryover question was, "What is your legacy?" And we talked about impact, right? And, and landing in an impact and we're at a spot where we, you know, you especially aren't, aren't ready to commit and define what that actually means in specifics, but everything you're doing is pointing to, to helping people figure this stuff out and make an impact, right? So, yeah. so in that, let's talk about some of the dots, you know, because a lot of this stuff is about connecting the dots, about figuring different things out. That's what we do on Thinking on Paper, a diverse group of technologies coming together and trying to figure out what it means, right? So let's talk about a couple of the dots that you may have connected to create uh, what you are building today. For sure. And maybe I'll start on the just the notion of impact. And, and I think the, the punchline there is um, with our company, Arena X, really the underlying principle and philosophy is human empowerment in the age of rapid technological advancement, uh, primarily driven by two massively uh, disruptive technological themes, which is artificial intelligence and Web3 and blockchain technology. So maybe starting there, um, you know, I'll kind of give a more truncated version this time, but I think the one of the the, the series of dots that I'm starting to kind of put together and uh, think through is um, with the emergence of AI and blockchain technology, I think what's happening is um, the concept and the notion of economics as a construct is radically changing. Um, and, and, and the reason why it's changing is because if you look at traditional economics, um, there are basically what economics are is the allocation of scarce resources into production a productive means uh, as a way to um as a way to kind of create uh productivity or economic growth right and traditionally in in these models there are a few different types of factors of production uh human labor land capital and more recently it's like this catch-all bucket of technology within all of that though um, there's one critical assumption that underpins all of this and is the assumption that these factors of production are scarce. Why is that important? Because all economic, all economic models, uh, are built off of this assumption. Um, and what we're entering into a world is this the actual break in this assumption where factors of production may no longer be scarce. Um, and I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination for people to start to kind of almost like vi visually and viscerally start to feel this because with artificial intelligence, where we're trending is labor is no longer going to be scarce. It's going to be radically abundant. Um, it is, it, it's going to be, um, for most tasks, uh, that humans uh, have historically been able to, uh, have to do will be very, very cheap, uh, and very, very easy to replicate by AI. Um, and then on the concept of capital itself, right? Historically, that uh, in terms of um, the concept of money, credit, and what you can do to actually finance growth, growth, that was assumed to be scarce. And very quickly, we're starting to see that that is in and it of itself not scarce either. Now, you can look at uh, the official channels of like uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy of central banks and governments. But if you look at crypto and blockchain, as it's uh, as, as a standalone entity, what it has created is basically for any person, group of people, or entity to, to basically create capital out of thin air. 
and use it as a way to bootstrap some type of growth behind an idea. So with these two things, we're creating a new type of economic paradigm that is radically different than how the world used to work. Um, and then one other uh, input that was historically a big assumption into this, this, this broader um, schema is humans, right? Through the, the, the channel of labor. And if things like technology is starting to uh, basically proliferate factors of production so that it's no longer scarce, where does that leave humans in terms of our role in this future uh, as these two kind of uh, technologies emerge? So I think if you, if you look at the public discourse around something like artificial intelligence, it always tends to come with this, um, this perspective of uh, potentially like a very dystopian view of what could emerge out of this, right? Which is displacement of human labor. You know, what, what is it that humans are able, uh, going to be able to do uh, when AIs are going to be able to do everything that we, we can do and even better? What, what becomes of the human race uh, in, the, in the age of super intelligence, right? There's this like kind of general exploration of where, where does humans fit into this emerging picture? And I think we have a generally more optimistic view on that outcome, um, but it's incumbent on, you know, companies, projects, and groups of people to explore um, how we can maximize kind of human endeavor and input in this new age of radical abundance. I think that's, you know, in, in a way that like an abstract way that um, we are approaching building up different products and, uh, you know, why we're building things like AI Arena, Arc, Sci, et cetera. And then where does the human fit in, in the age of super intelligence is a question that uh, we, we need to discuss more. Okay, so that's the, the background of how you're thinking about this. So could you, for our listeners, explain what is AI Arena and mm -hmm. how, because I believe it's for two different, you have the gaming side of it and you have the AI model development side of it and they are both separate separate entities but part of ai arena with the, the same goal end goal in mind yeah so let me let me kind of demystify that a little bit so the company is arena x we actually have two you can call it platforms um one platform is called arc arc is a an ai gaming infrastructure so arc is a technological stack that can power ai based game experiences and i'll come back to that in a second the other vertical is called Psy. Psy is actually a machine learning competition platform. Psy is more focused on a sophisticated uh, AI machine learning kind of researcher slash developer cohort. It's really designed to be an environment where um, the, the very sophisticated kind of researchers can go on and actually um, compete to create new types of AI or machine learning models. Um, so, so Psy is rather specific uh, to that audience. Arc is more generalized for application into the gaming context. Um, AI Arena is a game. AI Arena is, it was the first game that was built on Arc. So basically, as we were building AI Arena, we were building Arc because the underlying tech that needed to power a game like AI Arena did not exist. And to this date, probably still doesn't really exist. So we had to build everything on our own. Um, and as a function of building AI Arena, we've also matured the tech stack that supports it, which is called Arc. And now today, we're able to use Arc um, as a infrastructure product that we can start to distribute and help third-party studios integrate AI-based experiences into their games and also use the tools that are available uh, to solve a lot of the issues and problems and challenges with um, kind of game development uh, for especially like indie, indie studios. So hopefully that helps to clarify a little bit what the businesses are. Um, and then, so what is it, what is it that we're trying to achieve, right? Um, where's this like human empowerment angle come in? Um, under belying both of these things is the concept of like, how do we find human capital, human talent that can create uh, create outsized impact in the age of AI. Part of it is an education funnel. The other part is a discovery funnel, right? So think about AI arena 
as the education funnel. It's a gain, but the gain is designed to be kind of a Trojan horse to teach people about what machine learning models actually are. How do you train them? How do you make them better? Uh, what are the trade-offs that you're managing? And through playing a game, you can actually build up a very strong intuition base about how artificial intelligence works. Okay. So it's not, it's not just gamifying things. It's actually using a game as an apparatus, as a process to teach people about something that's a bit more complex. That's, that's, that's the idea behind AI arena of the game. Psy is more about if, if an AI arena is the top of the funnel, which is how can we use a game to attract more and more people into the field of AI, then Psy is more at the bottom of the funnel, which is, well, we already know there are people that are sophisticated in the AI. How do we ex identify more and more of them? Because currently there, I, there is a challenge in terms of um, uh, AI talent. If you look at the talent war in terms of large companies bidding for AI talent and how much they're paying to actually secure the best AI talent on the planet, the, the compensation packages that, that are being paid to these individuals is a strong market signal that there is a su supply deficit of talent, right? We don't have enough people in the world that really uh, can build solutions that can further the progress of AI and humanity. So Psy is designed uh, to be a platform to reveal hidden talent. Because traditionally, a lot of that discovery is through formalized channels like academia, uh, um, and basically right now it's academia. It's like you know, um, uh, you know, masters and PhD programs will give you the kind of the credibility uh, to be able to secure these uh, these type of roles. But we think there's a different way that we can come ar uh, come around and solve that problem, which is to use competition as a way to reveal talent. Right. And, and this is a lot more of a meritocratic process in the sense that, um, you know, you really do have to know what you're doing and you are competing against hopefully the best and best of the best in, in coming up with provable performance. Um, and and so so that's really the idea behind size. So all of this is kind of integrated. AI arena is like top of the funnel size is a bit more bottom of the, of the funnel, but it's all about cultivating interest of human capital into AI and then identifying who are the best that can contribute to future impact. Yeah. Where my, where my head goes on this, on the, on the talent side of the fence, you know, you, I, I think where you, the future is, is going to point to a couple of different things, very specialized technological talent, right? The ability to, you know, machine learning, LLMs, AI, um, you know, blockchain, all of these different technologies, but then also on the other side, I think you're going to have, uh, you know, an increase in the humanities, right? So philosophy, psychology, sociology, some of these things. And I, I see those two as highly, highly, uh, increasing as being the popular ones. And then the rest of them kind of being functions of either or as solutions come together to, to handle marketing solutions that come together to handle you know, business operations and all of these things that you go normally. What do you think about that? Uh, that is that is a very plausible outcome. I think, um, well, I think the end state is that, you know, if, if and when we get to a, well, probably more when rather than if, when we get to a stage of, um, you know, super intelligence, it, it would be hard to imagine, you know, many of what we consider to be like careers and jobs today to still be as relevant. So I think the, the, the extrapolation of that is humans should have more idle capacity, right? And if we have more idle capacity, what do we dedicate that time to? Um, and that could be more exploration of things like philosophy and um, the arts and creative domains. Um, but more from, not from like a mass production perspective, more from like an artisanal, uh, craft kind of perspective. So I do see that as like a, a potential outcome. Um, and then on the other end, at least from now until the point we become completely obsolete is yes, you do need, you do need more human engineering talent to build these solutions 
that continues to scale technology in that direction. So uh, in, in the process of getting there, I do think like this class of human capital is going to be extremely coveted. Um, and I, I, I think there's will be a constant kind of supply problem. I, I think I think I, I believe like Elon probably said recently earlier in the year is just like we we need more we need more of these engineers and it's very very difficult to uh, to hire them at at high volume but on the demand side there's so many problems um, that still needs to be solved uh, for a lot of these um, you know applications of AI to come to fruition so yeah I, and I probably share that. On the supply side of the talent, when you're saying that, it makes sense to me. And I, I think maybe blockchain, really good A-level blockchain coders are short on supply as well. But when you look, especially when I look on my feed in my echo chamber of AI applications, there just seems to be a new one every day. Everyone's adding AI to their tech stack. Everyone's launching an AI product. If there's a lack of talent, why are there so many applications appearing? Or, or am I being deceived by my echo chamber? Is there actually not really that many? Or are they just using other people's AI yeah. technology? Or Yeah, that my personal view is a big part of it is, a, is ascribed to um, basically it's like low effort application building on core foundational models like ChatGPT and these LLMs and generative models, right? Um, and what you see is like this rapid creative destruction type of cycle in AI where, you know, when GPT-3 came out, you know, there were, you know, I, I think at that point people were releasing things that they called, they, they called them like AGI or agents that it was like a convoluted patchwork of um, different APIs built on LLMs. And they were like, oh, these are like autonomous agents that can now do all these tasks, right? Fast forward like nine months, it's like, well, GPT-4 can do that out of the box. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's like, yes, there, it seems like there's a proliferation of volume of applications, but they're all kind of like reskins of a core foundational capability that are being provided by these like source models. Uh, it's not a value judgment to say that's either good or bad. It, it just what is right. This is a market economy, and people see opportunity. Um, and and what happened in this like last couple of years is that I think foundational models like LLMs was so impactful in creating uh, an apparatus for the consumer to to for the first time feel what AI is able to do, right? That was so impactful that it drew so much attention into this pocket of AI that investment, consumption dollars, all of those things were converging on this at the same time, which created this effect of, well, where there's money, there's opportunity. And where there's opportunity, people just like, you know, try out a bunch of different things. So there was an explosion in that in that sphere. And I think that's where you kind of feel the overwhelming, like this feeling of, wow, there's so much happening. Um, but I think a lot of that was, yeah, more of like a application layer that really didn't have any kind of barriers to entry. And it was, it was at risk of basically the, 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 the companies or the agencies that own these foundational models, they were going to basically absorb that through subsequent releases and, you know, inform people what we're all saying that where they're, they're like these capabilities and these apps, like <laughs> the next version of GPT will assume that and basically it would be available out, out of the box. And lo and behold, this is where we are, right? And, and you, now we're like with GPT-4, it's like multimodal. You know, there's so many different things that you're able to do with it now than just language-based um, applications, right? So so I think that will continue as an arc. But what I'm saying is like the, engine, the engineering talent that needs to go into researching and refining the GPT engine so that it can get to four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and, and onwards, that level of engineering is in short supply. Um, and it maybe it's not in short supply in absolute numbers, but in relative terms, it's certainly short relative to the demand, which is what can we build with all of this, right? Like there's so many more things that we can we can do to um 
quote unquote, come up with new, new foundational models in other application domains. That is going to be equally as transformative as, as LLM has done for speech or text-based applications. Like that is the level where I think there is uh, like a, like a deficit of, of talent. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk through a couple of things because earlier you mentioned the word abundance. I think you said super abundance and that automatically like for one reason or another points me to Peter Diamandis and like, you know, these, these competition prizes to solve the, the biggest problems in the world. Right. And is a little bit, and I'm just guessing this may be totally off base, but is a little bit of the side platform, the yeah. ability to point this technology to some really challenging problems and, and, and do more than, you know, I don't know if you saw Mark's uh, Apple rant, Apple intelligence <sighs> ran a couple of weeks ago, but like, you know, it, it's got, this tech has got to be pointed to do really good things. So tell us about, tell us about what Sai is doing. Yeah. I think spiritually is very similar to like the, the construct of X prize. Um, it is really, yes, the, the environments within Sai are framed as games. So what the researchers are competing on, um, like on the surface level, when you look at it, you're, you're like, these are games, but the games represent uh, a gradient of problems that quote unquote are not fully solvable. So you're, you're just constantly trying to come up with better and better ways of dealing with these challenges. And that's really the idea of Sai is can we reframe really um, important challenges or problems that um, people or groups are facing in different types of in industries and basically abstract that into a game to frame that problem and then release some of the best talent to solve this problem through this, um, through this uh, apparatus of the game. And why do we use game as the, as the platform? Because games are more engaging, they're more exciting. They're visually entertaining. So it's almost like, can we harness the power of like esports, right? Into a context where we can use that motivational factor and that social proof and that community building element to steer more and more attention, particularly the attention of talented individuals into dedicating their time and effort in solving these problems. And they may not immediately or directly understand that what they're doing is was like contributing through a crowd to the potential evolution and discovery of new ways of solving complex problems, but they don't need to know that. It's just that the platform is designed to do that. All they need to know is, all they need to experience is, wow, this is really fun. Like I'm, I'm, my model is doing really well in this game and I just want to figure out a better mousetrap to solve this problem. So that's, that's really kind of what Sai is, was what, what its DNA is. And it is harnessing the power of competition uh, to and the medium of like uh, gaming as an entertainment uh, uh, platform to, to, to kind of attract talent to solve these problems. What's an example of the challenge? Just a through line oh, there, sorry, Mark. On the, when we were speaking to Stanford last week about immersive environments and learning and teaching in immersive environments and how it was more effective and more and quicker and more efficient because of the sensory overload of a virtual environment and a game would work in the same way and then obviously if you go out into the future when the games are much more immersive and much more virtual then you would add to that i think it's a, a fascinating way to 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 go beyond gaming as entertainment and create gaming as an educational and learning experience yes yeah, absolutely. Um, again, yeah, I think this is why, you know, ostensibly when you look at Arena X, it's like, oh, these guys are in the gaming space. And it's like, yes, we are, but gaming is a means to an end. We're not necessarily just building games, right? Um, and certainly AI Arena, we don't think about it as just like a classical game meant to like entertain necessarily. We want the competitive side to attract the attention and really like inspire young people to explore AI by virtue of the experience that they had in AI arena. Um, and then the ultimate goal would be like, Hey, someone starts an AI arena. And then over time, they, they, they became really interested in AI and machine learning. They started research this whole uh, space on their own. And then they actually end up on the side platform. 
because now they're sophisticated and they're competing directly on the side, right? Like that would be the ultimate end state of all this is like we actually built up that pipeline of capital from the uninitiated to the super initiated that then are creating outsized impact for the world. What's an example on Psy of a, of a, of a challenge of a, um, yeah. Yeah. There are a variety of different like mini games that we're bootstrapping the platform with. And these, you know, visually you can think about them as almost like the classical arcade games. Some of them are, um, you know, it's like a side scroller and you're trying to like avoid obstacles as you're, and, and then you try to collect a high score. Um, other games are like coordination games. So there's a level of like, probably like game theory embedded in it. Um, still there are other games where from a more technical description perspective, it's like, it's like a, a reinforcement learning problem where if there's a vast exploration space or the state space, but there's sparse rewards within that space. Um, the sparsity of rewards makes it challenging to train an, <clears throat> an RL model to uh, basically um, uh, behavior if uh, behave efficiently or effectively in that environment. So, um, so that that's a very interesting challenge um, to to for for researchers to explore is like how can you make a more efficient model uh, that can solve sparse reward problems better than histor historical alternatives. So those are all kind of like cross sections of different games. You're just slightly targeting different types of problems. And then the idea over time is um, we kind of want the community to come to the table and uh, basically submit ideas for new games. And even uh, we may just offer an environment for them to build mini games that then they can quote unquote put onto the platform and have other people compete on as well. So related to, related to AI machine learning, you know, that, that sort of, that sort of um, technology is the idea to like have a hypothesis or a, you know, Hey, I, I think this thing can do that. And then turning that hypothesis into a game and letting people push it around and test it and try to figure out ways to solve it. Is that kind of the idea? Um, I, I'm not sure. I think some of it could be hypothesis driven. Others could just be well-known problems and challenges that exist already. And usually these problems and challenges is not like a definable outcome. It's not like a math equation where it's like, you know, solve for X and there's an answer for X, right? It's an open-ended problem where it's like, is there a better solution relative to what we have now? Um, so those are more likely to be the types of challenges that are going to be on Psy over time. Um, and I think those those problem statements are better suited for a competitive platform because, you know, in the context of games, we describe those as infinite games, right? There's no end. It's like, there's no, it's like, it's not a game where it's like a hundred levels. And after the hundredth level, there's, you're done, you're finished, right? It's, it's just a evergreen open-ended either exploration or it's an open-ended competition where there will never be finality to it. So, I mean, like a like chess would be an example of that, right? Like chess is a competitive platform. There's never going to be like no one's going to solve chess. <laughs> it's just someone's going to be always better than the, you know someone new is going to come in. They find a new way to exploit something about the game, and for a brief moment in time in the arc of history, they're going to be the best at the game. And then you just constantly evolve from there. So I think those are more of the types of challenges that are going to be framed as like game problems on side. Okay, I like that. Um, I want to just shift gears a little bit, mainly because I know that Jeremy is a Pudgy Penguin fan. He's a big fan of NFTs. He's always he's always talking about how much he loves NFTs and he thinks they're amazing and he wants more of them. Wow. Um, I read something on on the website and it was I think it was NFTs powered by neural network AI models or so words to that effect. As someone who who was around and has witnessed. NFTs lose anything that they had approaching respect. This sounds like a new way to do something useful with NFTs. I mean, I don't understand what you're doing or how you're doing it. Maybe yeah. you could help us understand what um, NFTs powered by neural network AI models actually means. Yeah, I mean, it's very simple. Um, I think the first step is to take a step back and really think about what NFTs are. I think... No 
there's a general association of NFTs with these image driven projects or not image like picture or graphic visual driven projects. Like Pachi Penguin is effectively like a community built around, built around initially like an art collection around these penguins, right? And um, there's many of these. And in the early stages of the NFT uh, evolution, the image file or pictures was the predominant type of intellectual property that was contained in an NFT. Now, what are NFTs? NFTs aren't that. NFTs is a general purpose IP container. Right, like that's what NFTs are. Is is this file any type of file structure? You can now drop it into this kind of tokenized container, and once you drop it into a tokenized container, what it means is you can you can actually exchange this a lot easier, uh, easily, efficiently, uh, on blockchain infrastructure, and you allow market mechanisms to create price discovery for this particular asset. So. When we started to explore NFTs, we viewed NFTs from this lens. It just so happens the market started to really, like the adoption was on the pictures side of things, but it's, you can, you can drop any type of, uh, intellectual property structure into it, music, um, AI models, um, you know, what have you, it doesn't have to be just image files. So that's, that was a starting point. So then what we said was, Hey, we, we have a specific type of file structure or intellectual property structure it's an it's a machine learning model um and if we can drop a machine learning model into an nft that's really cool because now you have a market mechanism to arbitrate whether or not a machine learning model is good or not right whereas historically it's very hard to prove number one that a model belongs to you or is created by you and number two even if you think uh or, or in fact the model is valuable how is there any mechanism for price discovery around that? So this is where blockchain has been a radical unlock for intellectual co property content types of all sorts. And I think there's still a lack of true exploration of different types of IPs being contained in things like NFTs and tokens. And that's really our underlying kind of thesis was like, okay, we can tokenize AI. That was a punchline. And then gaming was like, Okay, again, gaming became the apparatus for us to do it, right? It's like, it's one thing to tokenize AI. It's like, okay, well, that's cool. Like, what do you do with it? <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, I have tokenized AI, great, right? So now tokenized AI in the context of a game is now interesting because now the AI, if it can evolve and get better, now you can, you can frame it and actually have it be an input into a game environment and have the have the competition, which is what AI really is, about who can train the best AI, who can improve their model the most, right? Um, and, and then the, the, the other reason on why it should be on blockchain and be an NFT form is if you want this to be like a global competition and if you want to feature the best of the best, then having that financial aspect in terms of price discovery and speculation adds to the experience because it's a signal that attracts more and more attention and potential people who want to participate. And then you can also distribute value through kind of like competitions and tournaments and stuff in a very efficient way to a global competitive base, right? Through a native token or through some value accrual mechanism to, to your NFT. That is very difficult to do in traditional world, right? Like it's, it's, it's rather simple to, to structure a regional or a local tournament. It's very difficult to do it on a global scale. Like the administration of rewards itself will kill you <laughs> in terms of the frictions that's involved. So it's basically not possible. Um, that's where I think the magic of blockchain and uh, Web3 technology really, really adds a new, di new, new dimension to all of this. Let's yeah, let's unpack that a little bit. I, I love I love where you went there. And and, and for for clarity, uh, disruptors <laughs> and curious minds, I don't hate NFTs. Uh, I actually, I actually believe in in this, the the core fundamental uh, capability, as Wei mentioned, of the ability to encapsulate something digital, and create relationships with other digital things, and have attribution that points back somewhere else. I think that is awesome. Where well, your the NFT... definition is like an an IP container, 
was was very very good way to visualize it. Hundred percent. And so so way. Let's let's do a little thought experiment here. Okay, uh, we're famous for these on on thinking on paper. So say the three of us have created our own machine learning model, right? Like uh, we have we have our own uh, model, right? And we've encapsulated it as an NFT on a particular. It's for platform. a football game. Can we make it for a football game? Sure. Okay. Sure. Sure. I mean, sure. We can make it. We can yeah. make it for a for a, a football game, and maybe it's the be- here. Here's the functionality. The desired functionality of this of this model is to figure out the best trajectory for uh, a corner kick in mm-hmm. football. Okay, best trajectory mm-hmm. that has the highly like high likelihood of success for a header into the goal. All right, that's our yeah. that's our model. We each have one. We all feel really good about it. Uh, we've created a game. Uh, through Sci or, or one of your platforms where people can actually interact and test it. So as the test happens, as this interaction happens, it turns out that Mark has the best one. Right. Just the data that's coming back has the best one. It's my footballing mind, you see. That's what it is. I, I think that's what it is. So how does the data how does the data on the back end is it is it shared why Marx is so successful to the community and can the whole community learn? Or is it like Marx? Marx got all of his good knowledge, and you and I are struggling trying to refine ours. Like, talk me through how that works. Yeah, um, in the way that, like, for example, AI Arena is structured, um, the secret sauce is not revealed to the world because if it is revealed, then the person who had the secret sauce does not have any competitive advantage, and it would be kind of the antithetical to the competition itself. So um, now. What other people are able to do is they're able to still observe the output of someone's trained model, right? So if I train in this in this analogy, this like corner kick agent, um, we, you can you can still see how my corner kick agent performs when he does a corner kick, right? You can see that as like like game footage or video footage. And the challenge for you as a researcher or potentially a player in this game is like, how do I reverse engineer this effect, right? Because you can, you might be able to like pick up on the subtleties and it's like, huh, interesting. The way that they strike the ball is in this way. And it puts this type of like curve on the ball. Um, whereas my agent, the way that I was like instructing it to do certain things, I wasn't doing it in that way. So therefore, like maybe I should go back and tinker some parameters so that the behavior of how my agent strikes the ball changes to be more like what Mark has achieved. That's kind of the premise. But, and then as I could sell that, if it's on an NFT, I could then, if I become unbeatable in this game and I decide I've, I've reached my pinnacle, I'm going to go do something else. I can sell that. Yes. Can I? To you can. Jeremy for a yeah. huge profit and then he can go and dominate the game. So what, yeah. what, all right, here's another piece too. So what if I yeah. get the most, who's the most famous soccer coach in the world, Mark? Um, probably Guan City. Okay. So I, so I get this guy, pull him in. I say, Hey, I want you to help me build, uh, an AI model to help analyze why this soccer, why this corner kick guy is so good. And then mm-hmm. you come at it from that side. I mean, I, I, I can see how this like whole world could like spin up in, 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 trying to figure this end result out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say today, if someone is able to come up with a diagnostic AI to diagnose why other people's AI are so good, like that person deserved to be hired by like Open <laughs> or something like, that's not that's a non-trivial problem to solve and it would require a lot of skill. Well, isn't isn't that AGI? Doesn't that, when your know, super intelligence will be doing that, when it will be learning off other AI agents, so we will yes. out of the loop again? Yes, theoretically, but I'm hoping that we're still maybe a decade away from that <laughs> at least. But like, so today in the current moment, I think it's still very much a human uh, based engineering effort. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, like from that person, like as a thought experiment, certainly plausible. Um, but to your point, Mark, of like, can I then list my NFT on a market and sell it for a profit? Yes, theoretically you can. Oh, and practically, mechanically you can. Then it, it, it the, the, for that to happen is you need people to care about what you have done, right? So it, it may be a super niche if you said, this is a pure competition about like a corner kick niche, right? <laughs> like we might, like it may be a market of three people. So therefore really there's no price discovery for these assets. 
So if you're, but, but if you look at it in the context of something like AI arena, which is like a fighting game, there is a broader community of people who do enjoy the medium of fighting. That is the target market. And you, if you can get them to care about something like this now, now like each individual asset as contained by an NFT will have some market value, right? As so, yeah. So the idea is like, how do you take these kind of competitive primitives and create a problem around it, make it fun and then scale audience into it. So to continue our thought experiment, you know, pushing beyond the boundaries of reasonable uh, discourse maybe, but you know, say, all right, so say EA sports in their new FIFA game is getting a lot of terrible feedback that their corner kicks are not realistic looking and they're all yeah. dumpy and they're like, man, this, all their fans are like, that sucks. This part of the game is awful. They yeah. start peeking in and looking at Marco and Hey, you know, if his thing figures out how to make corner kicks realistic in video games, I might buy that thing, right? Yeah, so, okay. So Arc as a platform is designed to basically help studios solve these types of problems in games. Um, it's not exactly how you described it, but philosophically is kind of similar. So one of the service verticals of Arc is called we call it permanent player liquidity as a service. What we do is we actually help games build human-like bots to help with this concept of player liquidity. And what player liquidity is, is basically um, the fact that games suffer when there's not enough players in it, right? And for a lot of types of games, like especially multiplayer games and like competitive games, you have this degradation of a user experience as a function of the game not having enough human players. Uh, you have to wait very long time for there to be a match. Um, and sometimes what studios do is they do actually program their own bots in the game to kind of fill in the gaps, if you will, knowing that there's not enough players. So you need to you know, have something in there to keep people busy. But then real human players, when you play against those bots, you're like, oh my God, these bots are terrible, right? So it actually detracts from the experience. What we're able to do with Arc is we're actually able to um, utilize our player base who's actually sophisticated in this type of AI training game loop. And as long as, as soon as the, uh, a studio integrates their game into the ARC SDK or the platform, they get access to our player trainer platform. And the trainers are able to now train bots to be used in those games. Now, these bots are much more human like because they're trained by humans. Right. So now these games actually have human-like bots that improve player liquidity makes the game experience better um and really the bottom line is that it 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 carries over and impacts um player retention um it really enhances the overall quality of the experience that these studios are trying to deliver i just had a flashback of when i was 18 i was playing golden eye on the n64 and just how incredibly stupid the NPCs were, and they were just literally just walk in circles, and it, yeah. It, yeah, it wasn't much fun. And, and I know, I know, it's progressed a lot since then. But yes, there's still a huge problem with the, the NPCs, and yeah, I, I start, I start thinking like. about we're we're very interested. I start thinking about like the idea of a, a digital space, almost like an Orange Theory fitness on the fitness side, where like I could send my bots to get programmed to be good bots like good you know npcs to be folded into a game i just see like this yeah you know, this... yeah it's that's effectively one of the yeah that's effectively the first product on arc um and it's it's really starting to generate a lot of interest from studios because a lot of studios have this problem um so and it's exactly that it's making either npcs or kind of uh opponents in the games much more human-like so they're more interesting to play against um, and then there's like steps beyond that that we can add to the effect later on, which is once you have that as a primitive, then you can uh, you, you can actually um, collect more and more of like player data in that particular game. With that data, now you have what is effectively like a statistical distribution of what users are likely to do as a next step in the game. And what you're able to do is use that information and embed that into how you train these bots so that these bots are now predictive. They can actually anticipate what you're going to do next, and you can actually calibrate the difficulty for the individual player, right? 
it's, it's almost like um it's almost like it's like a very bespoke way of training someone to be get, become really good at something right like if you're in any type of like combat sport or any sport for that matter part of the part of the way like part of the friction of improving is a lot of times like you're not working on that marginal skill that can really kind of build a solid foundation for you to get to the next level so if you can start to make that more granular and more precise it actually helps people progress in terms of skill development more efficiently and in a gaming context it's just it makes the it makes like the game experience overall feel way more bespoke way more personalized and ultimately it should be much more engaging i love that have you have you read um the art of learning jeremy josh waitskin oh talks, yeah he talks about that, books. that granularity of the learning of how he became the open hands champion was by doing exactly that by just yeah. focusing on his one move hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times and then yeah. getting that perfect and then to the next one that's how he became the champion this sounds like it's a similar theory yeah i like it would you would you mind way entertaining one more thought experiment for me? <laughs> of course, of course. All right, so all right, let's go back to EA Sports. Let's go back to FIFA World Cup or whoever <laughs> runs that thing, right? You're not letting that go. No, I'm not. I'm not. So, so say Mbappe decides to license his uh, physical maneuvering likeness in a soccer game to EA. So he goes in. They put sensors on him. They volumetrically capture how he does a corner kick. And that particular likeness, just like any other name, Im image and likeness, has a monetary value. Could that be captured? Could that be converted into an AI model that would teach other things to do that thing exactly digitally? Yeah. Um... I'm a little bit out of my depth in answering that precise. I'm out question. of my depth in asking. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, Although I have to admit, Jamie, like as, some, as as a big lacrosse fan, I'm very impressed by your never <laughs> football and Mbappe corners. Wow. Um, I, I will say this. I will say this. Okay, so I'm gonna I try to answer the question without directly answer it, answering it. Um, but hopefully it gives you an idea of how we approach this type of problem. So. The way that Arc works as a platform when we integrate with a game is it's called a direct integration. So what happens is the game studio actually has to provide us some information about how the game works. Um, the technical term is about the state space. The state space is really just the environment of the game, factors that influence outcome, right? Think about those, those variables that impact how uh, a player can um, uh, extract different outcomes in the game. And then there's the other thing, which is the action, the action set, which is really like, what are the controls of the game and what these controls actually affect the environment or how this uh, player behaves. Once again, we have that information, we can basically represent any type of game on our SDK. And, th and then the training is basically, once you have that uh, framework, um, a player, all they have to do is they literally just play the game and then the agent is recording that data set and is able to, and then you're able to use that data set to basically train the agent on uh, how, they, how to progressively improve in this kind of game context. So that's how we do it. What you said, described, so it's, yeah, yeah, so it's performance in the game. As someone is actually playing the game, it records that and analyzes it. Exactly. That and, instead so of like exporting from physical to digital. Yes, so. yes. Now the, the, the issue with the export framework is that it's an imprecise representation of what's actually happening, right? So a very crude way of doing that would just be uh, recording pixel level information on a screen, right? You can, like I'm watching YouTube of someone playing a first shooter game. I can record that information. And theoretically you can say, oh, I just trained an AI model based on that visual input and then have that model learn through that visual input and how to behave in the game. The problem with that is, there are there are a lot of different edge cases. Number one, visual representation does not give you full information of the actual state, right? It's only one dimensionality view of what's actually happening. Number two, there's a lot of information that's actually not captured by pixels. And there's a lot of edge cases in terms of um, what you think you're watching 
relative to what the human actually is doing and their intentions. Like those are, there's a, there's a big gap there. So it's a long winded way of saying like a visual extrapolation of the game state is imperfect. And you're going to run into scalability challenges because what effectively your model learns is like it almost, it learns uh, useful behaviors if it was confronted with that exact situation. Anytime, any, it's, it's like a kid that learns things through memorization and they don't have critical thinking abilities to extrapolate. So as soon as you get to the last question on the test, they can't get it. Right, it's like, wait a minute, it's like, it's not two plus three plus five, like, and it's like a software X and they're like, oh, I don't know how to do this. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's like a similar outcome in terms of how a model would be uh, able to perform in, in a dynamic environment. So direct integration, which is what ARC is um, based upon, is much more robust, is much more generalizable to to the precise controls and the nature of how you want to manipulate these models. Okay, I think that's a good place to, to drop some some final thoughts. And I'm going to start because as I alluded to, I'm not sure if we got this before our little tech problem, but I alluded to researching this interview. I wasn't sure where to begin because there was so much going on with Arena X Labs and AI Arena. But now I think that Way's done an amazing job of kind of threading it all together. We started with the educational part of it, of how the game can be used to... To, to, to teach AI to get the good developers excited into doing this and get more of them being in. And then we moved on to the gaming aspect of it for the gamers. So it is a game in there. And so I think it was, and then brought together at the end, I thought it was very impressive. So now I, now I get it. So I way, it. My, my, my model has learned that we need to have a part two on this because there's <laughs> so much that you're doing that's really exciting yeah. that I'm really interested in that um, I would love to kind of stay in touch and, and and maybe as you guys are building things, come back and talk through some of these great examples. I mean, I think it's, I think it's fascinating. I think, uh, I think everyone else will find it pretty darn fascinating as well. Yeah. yeah and absolutely love to be back. And I think maybe, yeah, maybe next time I'll, I'll, I'll we'll also bring Brandon who, who, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm, I'm more of like, a, like a poser at a mouth mouthpiece. I'm not the engineering mind behind all of this. Brandon is, the, the engineering mind that built everything that we have on the tech side with the with the help of our very talented engineering team. Um, but yeah, I'd love to come back and revisit where we are maybe a little bit, maybe maybe early next year or something like that to 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 have you know an extension of this conversation because yeah, it, it's been it's been a lot of fun for me as well. So uh, I really appreciate you guys bring, bringing us on. Last question for you, Wei. Uh, what is one question you will leave for our next guest? It can be about any topic, any discipline, anything that's on your mind. Doesn't have to be AI gaming. Whatever pops out. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this is really difficult. Um, I would say, what 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 is the what is the one thing that makes you kind of get get up in the morning and just want to attack the day? Like what, what is that thing that just gets you going in the morning that, uh, you know, sets you on that trajectory to have a really good day? It's a great question. question. Great question. There you have it, friends and neighbors. We are, we are sponsored by Synthesis today. The, uh, the forcibly interconnecting of dots of information into knowledge and eventually wisdom. Mark, take us out of here. Well, I just will say that question will be asked to Com Boucle, who is the, the French country manager for coinbase who we've got on next week so we're going to be talking about the european perspective on on crypto so there is a good a good th thread here so that's going to be interesting if you're still listening please like and subscribe so we can get more amazing guests like way and join our book club where we'll be reading nexus by yuval no harari next um yeah stay disruptive be curious keep thinking on paper we'll see you next week bye-bye